and my delight in introducing him as the 2022 commencement speaker. Please join me in welcoming back Tom Schulman to MBA. Thank you, Brad. This is such a great honor. If someone had told me the day that I graduated MBA that I would ever be asked to stand up here and deliver this address, I would have told them that they were crazy, and all my family and friends would have said the same thing. Uh, I should warn you that in Hollywood, the conventional wisdom is, would counsel to never trust a speech on an important occasion like this one to a screenwriter. Uh, we're an unpredictable bunch. We can be too long-winded. We intentionally or unintentionally cross lines that shouldn't be crossed. But Brad Joya doesn't live in Hollywood and obviously didn't get the memo. So luckily for him, he's basically announced his retirement, so he's immune to the consequences. I will say if those chimes go off while I'm talking, I'm going to assume I'm being played off. Um, I also have to say that though Mr. Joya thinks I'm up here because he invited me, that's not the real reason. When I was at MBA, we were required to give a speech during our time here uh, to the entire school at General Assembly. During my sophomore and junior years, through a series of strategically acquired sore throats, coughs, and stomach aches, I managed to dodge giving a speech. When I broke my leg that Brad mentioned and was told that I would probably not have to come back to school until the end of till graduation, my first thought was, yes, I don't have to give my speech. But Headmaster Carter, may he rest in peace, was a persistent guy, and under him you didn't get away with anything. If you were caught cursing outside Moon's Drugstore, which I don't even think is there anymore, uh, or smoking in Florida during spring break, Mr. Carter gave you demerits. Uh, I'm as sure as I'm standing here that somewhere, wherever he is, Mr. Carter has a to-do list, and that is the real reason I'm up here. The real reason I'm up here, there it is. The re <laughs> The real reason I'm up here is that on that list of the words, Little Shulman still owes us a speech. Uh, 35 years ago or so, I sat down and wrote a movie about Mr. Sam Pickering, or inspired by Mr. Pickering, my teacher here at MBA. I don't want to go over that, the lessons of that movie. Instead, I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about some of the other teachers, teachings, and observations that have inspired me since. Just as a prelude, let me tell you that as far as teachers go, today marks a big change in your lives. Up until now, most if not all of your teachers have been chosen for you. As of today and for the rest of your life, you will choose your teachers. That's a daunting but mostly exciting task. The teachers you choose may guide you for only a few weeks or months or for the rest of your lives, but whatever the case, they will be your choice. Congratulations, as of today, you are free. And you will soon be our teachers, our role models, sooner than you think. So think about that. The early part of my writing career was plagued by frustration. I had ideas and stories, but none were fully formed or based on the experience, and based on the experience of so many aspiring writer friends who too often began screenplays but never finished them, I fretted about what to write. And I worried if I could pull off completing a, a good script. Then someone handed me a quote. It was originally attributed to the German writer Goethe, which gave the quote great gravitas for me. But I soon discovered that it was actually written by a Scottish mountain climber named William Hutchinson Murray, who earned some gravitas of his own by writing his first book while a World War II prisoner of war on toilet paper. When the Gestapo found the book and destroyed it and punished Murray, he astonished his fellow prisoners by simply starting over. Murray's quote is this, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never have otherwise occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man or woman would have dreamt would have come their way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. Those words jump-started my writing. No matter what kind of corners I write myself into, something always comes along from somewhere and gives me an answer. Whatever you can do 
or dream you can, begin it now. That part is from Goethe, and that is some of the best advice I ever got. I got interested in Moses Maimonides when I read what was said of him, which was, from Moses unto Moses, there was none like unto Moses. I think we'd all take that. Brad, you'd take that, right? Uh, Maimonides said a lot of wise things. Try, for example, reading his eight levels of charity. The one that struck me was, we must accept the truth from whatever source it comes. This sounds so simple, so, so straightforward, so obvious, but actually it's quite tricky. If we look into our hearts, if we are honest with ourselves, we will instantly recognize that when a source is someone we neither like nor respect, it's difficult to accept a truth when it comes from them. And the inverse is also true. When something comes from someone we like, we too often, we often too easily accept it. As if people we love or admire are somehow incapable of being wrong. I found Maimonides' teaching, or that quote, a difficult one to follow, especially when the truth comes from my wife, who is almost always right. But I can tell you that honoring it expands our horizons and benefits us all. Harold Clerman was the founder of the groundbreaking group uh, theater in New York. He directed numerous plays on Broadway and ended his career as a theater critic for the magazine The Nation. When I first got to Los Angeles, I enrolled in a workshop called the Writers and Excuse Me, the Actors and Directors Lab, and I was lucky enough to have Mr. Clerman come every couple months to review our work. Clerman was one of the best educated men I ever heard speak. He could talk for hours and never bore you. It was as if he had been everywhere on the planet at all times throughout all of history. He was constantly reminding us of how many things we do as a society uh, that are, we do now that have been done over and over throughout human history. One of the things he said is, life is a play with a lousy third act, but it's still a great play. He talked about going to see a production of Hamlet in Germany. The play lasted four and a half hours and when it was over, the audience booed nonstop for 45 minutes. <laughs> Clerman's reaction surprised me. He said, Give me people passionate enough about their theater, their art, their loves, their hobbies, their professions, that they could boo for not 45 minutes. Find your passion. John Locks was one of my philosophy professors at Vanderbilt. Uh, he won the Chancellor's Cup several times for being one of the most popular teachers on campus, and his classes were always filled minutes after registration opened. Forty years later, at a Vanderbilt reunion, Professor Locks spoke to a group of us alumni. Turns out that after years of looking for the meaning of life in such sunny-sounding books as Kierkegaard's Fear and Trembling and Sickness Unto Death or Heidegger's Being and Nothingness, Dr. Locks had settled on a simpler formula. Take the time each day to live in the moment. Take the time to notice the way the rain rolls down a window pane. Notice the way the leaves float in a stream. Notice the way your pet's coat looks or the flowers in your garden smell or a song sounds or the joy in a loved one's smile. We spend so much time dwelling on the past and even more thinking about the future, but if we don't take time to live in the present, we will end up one morning wondering where it all went. My first week at USC Film School, a fellow student walked up to me. He was excited. He had just heard a lecture by the novelist and poet James Dickey. Dickey was a Southerner from Atlanta and was one time Poet Laureate of the United States, but he's probably best known for his book Deliverance, from which the movie Deliverance was adapted. My friend heard Dickey say the following, In the modern age, it's possible for a person to live their whole life and never know whether they are a hero or a coward. I think they should know. Now you could spend hours unpacking that one, but for now I'd just like to say a few things about it. At first blush, it sounds like the kind of macho challenge that could have been issued by a Hemingway or a Kipling or a Churchill. It seems aimed at battlefield heroism and the like. Well, I don't know about the heroism part, but there are garden variety opportunities for courage all around us if we take them. How often have we heard people say something we disagree with and we stay quiet? How often does our desire to be accepted and liked get in the way of our doing or saying what we feel in our hearts? So I say at a minimum, look for places to have the courage to speak up, to speak your truth, and you will not spend your life not knowing. You will know. And every time you act despite your fear, you will grow and become a stronger person. My two sons have taught me so many things, but one I'd like to share with you is, has to do with the Eureka Effect. The Eureka Effect is another name, 
excuse me, uh, for that thing that happens when you try and try and try to solve a problem and then a few hours later, maybe you get in the shower or opening a refrigerator door, the answer comes to you. Turns out the Eureka effect is a reliable phenomenon. You can count on it and harness it. Dozens of writing problems I've had have been solved that way. Now one of my sons, if given a school assignment on Monday, because he liked to get things over with, he'd come home, do the assignment on Monday night. Tuesday or Wednesday, he'd wake up with another idea, put it in the assignment. Same thing would happen on Thursday. And then he'd re-revise it, turn it in on Friday. My other son was a procrastinator. He'd wait and do the assignment on Thursday night and even maybe Friday morning. Then what happened? On Sunday, he'd wake up with another idea. On Monday, he'd get another idea. But he'd turned in the assignment and it was too late. Both my kids were equally bright, but you can guess which one made the better grades. Procrastination isn't a problem because it's lazy. It's a problem because it precludes us from using the Eureka effect to our advantage. Sometimes a word can teach us something. For me, such a word is schismogenesis. We all know what that means, right? Uh, roughly, it means the tendency of a culture or society to consciously shape or inform itself in direct opposition to another culture, usually a rival or proximate one. There are obvious examples like Athens and Sparta, and there are a number of emer emerging prehistoric antecedents as researchers learn more and more about prehistoric peoples. To my way of thinking, there are whole society, these are whole societies and groups who never heard of Maimonides. Rather than being open to the truths from others they didn't like, they actually took pains to intentionally outright reject them. To me, no word better describes some of the problems infecting our politics in so-called culture wars. And I hope that you, that we all can recognize the purveyors of schismogenesis and not fall prey to it. David Cypress was a student at Harvard who dropped out to become a cartoonist. And he began submitting cartoons to the New Yorker, which was and is the sort of Mount Everest and Mecca for illustrated cartoons. Every Monday, an, an office that the New, York would open, New Yorker would open, and hopeful cartoonists would file into the reception room and wait for an interview where they could show their most recent work. Cartoonists who had cartoons accepted in the past were usually ushered into the back where they could show their latest creations to the cartoon editor. Cartoonists who would never had a cartoon accepted at the New Yorker were instructed to leave their cartoons in a box on the receptionist's desk. David Cypress went to the New Yorker office with a new cartoon every Monday for 25 years before he got one accepted. 25 years with friends and family trying to be supportive, but more than occasionally saying, David, maybe it's time to give up. How many of us could believe in ourselves through that kind of epic rejection? And by the way, David Cypress is now the cartoon editor for The New Yorker. He's taught us, me a lot about perseverance. One day I was channel surfing in my car when I happened upon the Wharton Hour. It turned out that Sirius XM Radio used to give certain colleges and universities an hour once a week to program as they pleased. That day on the Wharton School of Business Hour, they were hosting Adam Grant, for years one of the most popular professors at the school. When I tuned in, Grant had already delivered his prepared remarks and was doing a Q&A when someone asked him if there was anything that could guarantee success in business. The class laughed. That's not a stupid question, Grant uh, interrupted, because the answer is yes. There is something you can do that will guarantee success in business. Give as much time and energy as you can, helping anyone and everyone who asks you for it, for free. And make sure everyone you work with knows you're happy to help if they need you. Soon, people will find you indispensable and you will rise through the ranks like a rocket. Turns out Adam Grant is an author of many books, one being Give and Take. The book examines the success of people who are givers versus people who are takers. It turns out that the bottom third on the corporate ladder are the givers who give too much so that they neglect their own work. Takers are mostly in the middle, so who is on top? Givers again. William James was a great scholar, psychologist, philosopher from the turn of the 20th century. At the time, most who knew James considered him the smartest man alive. Okay, not as hot as Maimonides, but we'd all take that one too. James said this, three things in human life are important. The first is to be kind. The second is to be kind. And the third is to be kind. Henry Miller was a controversial writer. He worked as a telegraph dispatcher until his mid-30s with seemingly no ambitions but to womanize, drink, and read. 
But after he started writing, in no time he created a new literary form, the autobiographical novel. Many of his books, like The Tropic of Cancer, were banned in the United States for their explicit sexual content. I had the pleasure of going to an evening with Mr. Miller in the late 1970s, and he read from the opening of the pages of his book, Black Spring. What he read hit me like that James Dickey quote. I won't read all of it, just the part that sort of cracked open my head. I am a patriot of the 14th Ward, Brooklyn. The rest of the United States doesn't exist except as an idea or history or literature. The boys you worshipped when you first came down into the street remain with you all your life. They are the only real heroes. Napoleon, Capone, all fiction. Napoleon is nothing to me in comparison with Eddie Carney, who gave me my first black eye. No man I have ever met seems as princely, as regal, as noble as Lester Reardon, who by the mere act of walking down the street inspired fear and admiration. Jules Verne never led me to the places that Stanley Borowski had up his sleeve when it became dark. All these boys of the 14th Ward have a flavor about them still. They were not invited or imagined, they were real. Their names ring out like gold coins. Johnny Paul was the living odyssey of the 14th Ward. That he later became a truck driver is an irrelevant fact. Without mentioning names, so many of the people who are my heroes to this day were the people I grew up with. Many were classmates of mine here at MBA. One guy, three quarters of my size, and I was small, saved us when we went to paint the goalposts at Hill Hillsborough High School by single-handedly fending off 10 of the Hillsborough High football team that had jumped us. Another classmate led us on great nighttime adventures to the tops of all the clock towers of Nashville. A friend carried me in his arms half a mile after I cut my knee wide open to the bone on a drainage pipe. The couple in the car he flagged down drove me to the hospital and missed their son's high school graduation. A college pal drove a car, <coughs> the car of a guy who had tried to beat me up into a ditch. The teachers that Brad mentioned here at MBA were my heroes because they came to my hospital room and home every day after school for eight months to help me keep up with my schoolwork so I could graduate with my classmates. So look around at your friends and schoolmates. Other people will enter your lives and to be sure these people will remain, will remain um, be important. But your classmates, the people you're looking at here, will be some of your heroes for the rest of your life. Lastly, and I warned you that screenwriters could be long-winded, lastly, one of my greatest teachers was my father. Dad gave me all sorts of advice during my childhood, mostly unappreciated at the time. The one I remember most was, don't be the kind of person who was born on third and thinks he hit a triple. Don't be entitled. Remember how many people you owe for who you are. And he persisted with advice until the day I packed up my car with everything I owned and left for California to try to make it in the movies. My father came home from work that day to see me off, and after he and my mother told me that they loved me and that I was always welcome to come home if I wanted, my father told me he had some advice. I waited. As tears filled his eyes a little, he said, drive carefully. I waited. Nothing more came. That's it? I asked. That's it, he said. We all hugged, and I drove away. On the road, I stewed over this. When it came to advice, such brevity was out of character for my dad. Had I insulted him in some way? Had he finally, out of exasperation, perhaps given up on me? Then it hit me. By saying nothing else, he was telling me that I was ready, that I was prepared, that he had given me all the advice I needed, and that he believed in me. So I want to close by saying that I went to MBA. I got a great education here. I know as well as I know anything how well prepared for life you are. So after all the advice I've given you, I'd like to close with the only piece of advice you really need, and that is drive carefully. Thank you.